I am the program director for the Alpine Historical Society. And today we have Cherry Diffenbach, who is a East County and further historian, further beyond East County. Um, her program today is going to be pretty much on East County cemeteries. Totally on. Totally on East County cemeteries. And our president is back manning the video. We have started videoing all of our programs so we can put them on the Historical Society website. So if you miss it or you want to go back and watch it again, there are three of them on there now, and this will be the fourth. It's actually not on the website, it's on YouTube right now. And as soon as our new website is finished, they'll all be migrated onto that as well. So, without further ado. Looks like I'm gonna be the latest YouTube influencer, huh? <laughs> I never thought that. Good afternoon, my name's Cherry Diefenbach. I've been an East County resident for 35 years. I am a his local historian and author and editor of several books, and we've got a couple of those books on the table back there. Um, I'm cut my presentation today, we'll talk about cemeteries in East County. It's not every cemetery in East County because we don't have enough time to talk about it, but I think you'll find it interesting because there'll be cemeteries you never knew existed, and maybe you'll learn something about the cemeteries that you didn't know were there. San Diego County was once, and oh, by the way, ask me questions, feel free to ask me questions um, at any time during the presentation. San Diego County was once home to 140 cemeteries and family plots, but over time, uh, development and wildfires have erased traces of many of them. Um, and the people that knew where they were have passed away. So we're losing history, but we all know that. Bury your, bury your dead in the, in the cemetery. Many early uh, grave sites were located on hillsides where they offered, wait for it, a view to die for. <laughs> and good drainage. <laughs> Over the years, wildfires and vandals have uh, destroyed or removed many of the head markers, and that makes finding their locations very difficult. In the absence of formal burial records, which many of these old cemeteries, is the case in many of these old cemeteries, how do you know who's buried there? I used uh, census data, delinquent tax records, old newspaper and pioneer accounts to provide clues about who this was in the cemetery. Um, unfortunately, newspapers didn't always cover deaths, and especially in the backcountry area, so you can't rely on them. Newspapers also got the names misspelled, Ancestry, uh, not ancestry, census records got the names misspelled, sometimes even the sex of the child, so you really have to double check and triple check your information. Okay, these are the cemeteries that we're going to talk about today, and some of them are probably familiar to you. I'm in alphabetical order. So I'm categorizing these cemeteries as pioneer cemeteries because someone, at least one person, was buried there in the 1800s. So using that criteria, Alpine Cemetery just barely made the cut. And the Milkwatai Pioneer Cemetery appears to be one of the earliest in East County. Now there are other ones, like I said, that aren't included here that may be earlier, but this gives you a fairly good representation. Um, the presentation will provide some quick facts about each of the cemeteries and highlight their unique characteristics and noteworthy occupants. And again, ask me questions if, as they come up. Okay, next slide. Alpine Cemetery. I bet most of the people in this room have visited the Alpine Cemetery. So, here's the trick question. Who can tell me how many people in the cemetery are dead? <laughs> Buried in the 
cemetery where they died. Dr. Nichols, Alpine's first female doc, was buried there in 1903. Likewise, many of the members of the Edward A. Foss family are there too, though Ed himself was buried in, under an oak tree in his yard in 1898. He died of heart failure. In 1929, a fire burned most of the wooden grave markers, so many of the graves are without identification, especially the, old, the oldest graves that would have had those wooden crosses or those wooden head, head markers. Somehow, Frank Gerard Hand's headstone survived. German-born Frank had recently moved his family from Oregon to Dehesa. He died at the age of 55 from heart failure in 1900. <laughs> the Alpine Cemetery includes a, a very nice Veterans Memorial Shrine and where the VFW conducts, conducts services on Memorial Day. It has a memory garden set aside for cremains. Today, a caretaker maintains the cemetery grounds and burials are primarily limited to Alpine residents. What happened in Alpine happened in Julian and many of the other cemeteries. People from the city found it was cheap to bury their their loved ones in these small, small rural cemeteries. So all of a sudden you have people coming in, you know, looking for a good deal. <laughs> and of course the Alpine Cemetery is not the oldest cemetery in Alpine. You all are probably familiar with the Mount Pisgah Cemetery, and I'll cover that one later. The Tiny Campo Cemetery is locally, located directly behind the Sheriff's Substation in Campo. Uh, since the area was home to the U.S. Army, Arm, Army Calvary during the early 1940s, it's sometimes been referred to as Camp Lockett Cemetery. But there's no military connection there, no, no dead soldiers were buried there. It's a much earlier cemetery. This slide shows the before and uh, the cemetery before and after it was refurbished by the Mountain Empire Historical Society. I'm a member of the Mountain Empire Historical Society, the Alpine Society, and the Lakeside Historical Society. But the Mountain Empire Historical Society in Campo uh, uh, restored a couple of the graveyards out there, and this is one. We used uh, ground penetrating radar to identify possible grave locations, and then iron crosses were placed on, on the grave sites. A new fence and a cemetery plaque was then added. We're pretty sure there were burials outside the fence. This is a very small area, something like, I don't know, 18 by 29 or 30 feet. So it, there, there were other, it would get quite crowded if everybody was in there that we think is in there. But <laughs> we will not know. Okay. I have a question. Is it still active? No. Okay. No. And yeah, I, I should probably tell you, I think it might stay there under quick facts. Does it say? It's not active? It says inactive. Inactive, there you go. So on all my, all my slides, I, I give those, some of those basic facts, active or inactive, the earliest burial, and, and a little other information. So this, this particular cemetery was started as a family plot for the Gadskills. Sil uh, Silas and Lumen Gadskill settled in Campo in about 1869. They opened a store, a blacksmith shop, they, they had a grist mill and a lot of other things. Um, just recently, I, I have this book that you'll see back there. This book, I think it was published in 2017. This year I found out that one of the people that I thought was buried there has the wrong first name. Even though a Gaskill descendant said her name was Florence, it turns out her name was Arletta. And I found that in a pioneer journal from a different family who Describe her the fact that she had died there. So you know, you just you think you've got all your sources, you think you've checked all the information that's available, and then you come up with something uh, recently. So it's not a big deal. But she was the first one in. She was very young. She was a little over a year. Um, there are several other Gatskills buried there. Cortland Gatskill was Lumen and, si and Silas's dad, and two of Lumen's sons are also buried there. You may, uh, you may, boy, it's dark in here. You may, may recall <laughs> the early practice of the Kumeyaay was to cremate uh, their, their dead. After Indian reservations.
reservations were established in 1893, uh, Indians were buried on reservation, in reservation cemeteries. However, this cemetery is thought to be the final resting place for Captain Billy, who was a full-blooded Native American uh, with connections to the south, south of the border. According to Ella McCain, who was an early pioneer, uh, she wrote in her book, Captain Billy, Captain Billy asked the Gadskills to be buried like a white man. So they made him a nice coffin and buried him in a white suit of clothes with a white shirt and tie. There's no indications where his wife Maria was buried. So we may have in that cemetery the only Native Americans uh, representation. And I'm not talking about all the Indian uh, cemeteries today. So that was one of the things that makes it unique. <coughs> This one is the Ellis Ranch Cemetery. And you can see when it was, oh, your next, next yes. slide, sorry. Okay, it's still an active cemetery. It was started as an, an Aguilar or Ellis family plot. And even <laughs> though it has the name Ellis, I, if I was a betting person, I would say that it really wasn't Aguilar that went in the ground here first. Uh, Gavino Aguilar and his wife Gertrude raised a large family, eight children, on their 180-acre ranch called uh, Santa Gertrude Rancho near Descanso. Since several of their children didn't make it to adulthood, one can guess that they probably were buried in the cemetery. So if you go to the 1870 census and you see there's this child, and then you go to the 1880 census and you see that child doesn't exist anymore, chances are that child is this was deceased. So that's some of that's some of how you can use the resources to determine that. Okay. Uh, in 1882, Gavino Aguilar himself was found dead on the road to Guatai Valley. He had been shot in the side and the head by his grandson, 21-year-old Andronica Lopez, who, and Lopez pleaded guilty to the shooting and he was sentenced to life imprisonment in San Quentin Prison, and he died there. The Aguilar headstone in this photo is a new one. Um, one of the books that I used as a reference talked about the old one. It had all sorts of misspelled words and talked about the guy being hit in the head with a rock. So this was a new one, but even it is not without a mistake because Gavino was actually buried five days earlier than what the headstone indicates. How do I know that? Because the newspaper reported on his murder. And he, he was murdered before, and not before that, five days before that date. Gavino's uh, wife, Antonio, and his daughter, Isadora, and her husband, Charles Ellis, are also buried in the cemetery. Uh, they inherited much of the, of the Aguilar Ranch, and, and Charles Ellis, descendant believes a baby named Lucy was buried there in 1879. I always take those things with a grain of salt and use that, use that source and try to verify. It's pretty hard to do that. Um, sometimes it'll just say believed to have been. So it, we think at least someone by 1879 was there. I think earlier. Um, Oh, some other guys, some other, maybe if I looked at my screen, I'd be able to, but then I'm, then I'm not going to, you won't be able to see. Two noteworthy latecomers to this cemetery are Granny Martin and Molly Birdso. Uh, Granny was one of, was a, a stockman and a vaquero in the Descanso, Mount Laguna, and desert areas. And a lot of people know of Granny Martin. A lot of Martin property, and the Martins still own, the Martin Family Trust still owns part of the cemetery, I believe, and as does Ellis, Ellis Family Trust. Yeah, Trust. Okay, over the years, the Ellis descendants have made improvements to the cemetery. You can see those on the screen, that monument in, um, in 1971. There's a flagpole there. Um, this cemetery is an active one with a connection to the Alpine Historical Society. That would be Corinne Lewis and her husband, John Lewis. Corinne and John adopted the cemetery and they've been spent many hours documenting grave locations, improving cemetery grounds, and updating cemetery records. And that's a, a 
hard thing to do. Raise your hands if you've ever been to the Flynn Spring Cemetery. Hey, all right. I didn't expect to be. Okay. Good, good. That's more than I thought. It, for those people who haven't been there, it's located um, on Old Highway 80, just west of Juan Giovanni's Italian restaurant. Um, and it's, it's surrounded by a trailer park. And supposedly there are 50 people in there. I'm going to guess that some trailers probably got put on some older graves. It's, it's a pretty small footprint today. The first burial was in 1876 on land donated by William Ebenezer Flynn, and he was the guy that Flynn Springs was named for. That, that was a child, his granddaughter, named Elena Clara Mock. <coughs> William and Sarah were the founders of Flynn Springs. The cemetery contains uh, a number of the Flynn descendants and relatives, including the infant son of Willetta Flynn Benton. And Robbie died of measles when he was less than a year old on Corte Madeira Ranch. And so they brought the baby to Flint Springs to be buried. A lot of times there's no mirror cemetery. See, so they had to put them, you know, they had to cart them, some, take them somewhere because there wasn't anything nearby. Or you could bury them on your own property. Uh, later on, a number of non family members were allowed to be buried here. We think about 50 total people are in the cemetery. For more about the Flynn Springs Cemetery and the Flynn Springs area, I highly recommend this book. It's back there on the table. It's called This Was Yesterday, Recollecting San Diego's Back Country. It was written by Julia Flynn DeFreight. She was born in 1876. She tells lots of good stories about uh, early San Diego, Old Town, the Flynn Springs area, the Scanso, Corte Madeira, and it's a real good, easy read. This book was out of print. It was published in the early 50s, and the Mountain Empire Historical Society recently updated it and published it. May, may I add that there are a few Indians, early in early California Indians, that are also in the place. In that place? Okay. And there may be, I, I use a couple of books. I didn't bring the other one. There's a book written, um, written by a couple of gentlemen that on San Diego County cemeteries. I didn't recall that there was uh, comments about cemeteries being buried, uh, Indians being buried in that cemetery, and Julia Flynn didn't mention anything about Indians. That doesn't mean they weren't. No, no, she, she did mention it. Oh, okay. Years ago, I read a book about the Flynn Springs area, and it mentioned a couple farm workers that had died and they couldn't take enough time away from taking care of their ranch or their farm to take them to another cemetery, so they took them to the Flint Springs one. So to answer your question, probably. Yeah. They, there were people, I, I know there's a story in a book about a, a former, I think it's a soldier in the Spanish-American War who was maybe dying of tuberculosis, and his parents were driving by in a wagon, and they stopped, and the Flynn's were generous enough to let him be buried there, so they had no connection to him. Okay, so again, I recommend um, that book if you have it. Next slide. If you, if it's a good read, good read. Okay, Julian Cemetery, the Haven of Peace. Sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? And if you look at the picture there, it has a terrific view, doesn't it? Probably the best best view in town. I think that's probably why they wanted to put a hotel there. And so the Cemetery Association was formed in 1922 to put a kibosh on that. Um, has anybody in here gone to Julian Cemetery? We have some cemetery groupies in here. Good for you. Okay. The earliest documented um, burial in this in this graveyard was believed to be a woodcutter who died in 1870. 1870. Uh, Julian historian and author David David Lewis wrote a book about the cemetery, which covers a lot of the highlights. I would have this book for sale, but you can get it through the Julian Historical Society, and it's a good read. And again, Julian faced the same thing that Alpine did. They stopped allowing people that didn't have a connection to Julia be buried there because it was going to be totally flatlanders. 
Okay. Um, some of the people that are buried here was in the cemetery is um, a guy named, uh, what is his name? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, Drury Dobbins uh, Bailey. And he came to Julian about 1869. He took up a mining claim. He got 160 acres. And he set out the streets in the town. He donated land for the town hall or school. He's the one that named the town after his brother, Mike Julian. Okay. And then a couple others. Now, there are a lot of people, and this book has them. I'm just hitting a few of the people and making some connections um, to, if, yes, thank you. Just a little light. Little, oh, yes. Oh, Bless yeah. you. Bless your heart. <laughs> that can do what I need. I, I, I don't have my radar vision on yet. Okay. So two other people buried here are Mary Klein and John McLaughlin McCain. They were neighbors in the Milwaukee Valley area. They eloped to Julian and got married there because there was bad blood between Mary's father, who was also a justice of the peace, and her husband. Both are buried at the highest point in the Julian Cemetery called Pioneer Circle. Uh, John McCain. Oh, yeah, next slide. You can, I'm sorry. You're right. I should have said something. I was so thrilled about having light. Um, <laughs> uh, John McCain worked as a freighter, a stockman, and a blacksmith. Mary ran the Mountain Glen Hotel. And John also donated a lot of the land to the cemetery and was very active in the Julian uh, Cemetery Association. This Cemetery is unique. I haven't come across any of the other ones that I researched. There were no African Americans buried there. Julian has several, including husband and wife Albert and Margaret Robinson. They opened an early bakery and a restaurant, and later the Julian's Hotel Robinson. That hotel still exists today as, ho as Hotel Julian, I think, Ju the Julian Hotel. Albert died in. 1915, and his wife continued to run the hotel until about 1921. There's some other African Americans buried there. In fact, the gentleman, David Lewis, who did the Julian Cemetery book, has got a new book at the printers, when I was at the printers recently, and it's gonna be all about African American influence, involvement in Julian. So that should be hitting the street soon. Do any of you recognize the location of the Milwaukee Pioneer Cemetery? It's located in a field top of Highway 94, just east of the Motor Transport Museum. Okay, this is a, a 2016 Google Earth view of the cemetery. The orange arrow indicates a location of the grave of William Derrick, who was buried then under a tree. The tree has since died. There are probably many other burials that did not make it inside the new perimeter fence. Based on my research, at least 36 people are estimated to be buried here. Ground penetrating radar indicated that it was higher, more like 55. But we did, were not able, we did not have time to run the ground penetrating radar outside the fence. We were only, who was it doing, the Border Patrol? Or? Yeah, Border Patrol. Border Patrol was using their ground penetrating radar, radar at our cemetery as a training experience. And so that's why we got it done, because I think it would be expensive. <coughs> Next. This is the earliest known photo of the Milwaukee Cemetery. The orange area indicates the grave markers of James Gray and an infant Gray. You can also see some wooden head markers in the background. Those are long gone. And then the if you notice there, you, you can see those stones sort of, let me see if I can do it. They went to so much trouble, I better use this. You can see this stone grave back, back behind us. This is that George Washington McCain grave that I showed you on the very first slide of the presentation. It works. <coughs> okay, next. This cemetery has often been called Campo's Boot Hill. Because about a fourth of its occupants died by violent means. And of course, if you look at the time frame, things were pretty rough and tumble out there uh, in East County. And I'm not going to go through all of the different circumstances of the death. I'm just going to hit the first one. Many of these were covered in newspaper articles. And the newspaper articles are very graphic. 
in their information. Makes for interesting reading. They don't leave a, out a lot to imagination. In this case, um, in 1875, they reported on the murder of William Andrews, a white settler along the San Diego to Yuma Road. Back then, when a murder was committed, the local justice of peace would convene a coroner's jury to perform a local in inquest. After justice, and, and I realized when I was putting this presentation together, Lou and Gaskell is involved in everything. You'll keep hearing his name. He was one of the guys that came to, the brothers that came to Campo and, um, in 1869. But he had a, lot, uh, had a long reach, let's put it that way. So after Justice Lumen Gaskill called together the jury, it was found that Andrews had died from blows to the head by a blunt instrument, and that his throat had been cut from ear to ear with a knife. While the jury was unable to determine who the person or persons were res responsible for this, the newspaper placed the blame on the Indians. That's something they did frequently. The Indians got blamed for just about everything. And sometimes there were witnesses and the Indians actually did kill someone, but who knows in this particular case. The deceased estate was later charged about $183. This included $15 for a wooden casket. Having recently buried a loved one, I can tell you that was a really, that was a bargain. <laughs> okay, next slide. In 1873, James Gray was murdered by his neighbors. These were white neighbors, not Indians, in the Mount Laguna area. The men had been drinking when a dispute over livestock began. His wife, Elizabeth, miscarried an infant <coughs> and shortly after the father and baby were buried. Sure. Shortly thereafter, the father and baby were buried together. This unique above-ground tomb was added by the family sometime before 1914. Remember in the picture I pointed out, it was just, uh, it was just two headstones, a big one and a little one, uh, kind of the ordinary headstones you might expect. But a newspaper article in 1914 showed a brick tomb that had been added to this, it was added by the family. And these photos show the James Gray tomb it, its deterioration and later restoration by the Mountain Empire Historical Society. And, and Larry Johnson did a pretty darn good job. <laughs> okay, next slide. George Washington McCain fathered 19 children with two different wives. Yeah, he's a busy guy. <coughs> About 1869, he and his family settled in a valley near Boulevard that is known today as the McCain Valley. G.W. is said to have died from the loss of blood after a Milwaukee neighbor, Lumen Gatskill, failed to properly insert a catheter. Of course, Gatskill was not trained as a physician, but that did not stop him for, for, from practicing medicine. And in fact, back in those days, the, the county, I might even been the state, would publish a list of people practicing medicine that shouldn't be. It was like the, the bad list. And he made it. He made it on that list. Next. I'll go back to that one just a bit. So let me just say, this is what it looks like after restoration. This headstone was found in the dirt on its face. And it was the original headstone. And it was nice to be able to reuse that. Um, one of the articles it, that I read, uh, read about the Gray tomb was at some time, some point, McCain's headstone made it over to the Gray tomb. But of course it didn't belong there, but it was loose. So we've got things tidied up a bit. You can see nobody's moving that one again. <laughs> okay, next slide. Will McCain was a son of uh, George Washington McCain. He was just 17 years old when he was killed by Indians near Hakumba. His death sparked some serious retaliation by the local stockmen and cowboys in an incident that was later called the Hakumba Massacre. And it's called the Hakumba Massacre because some number of Indians were killed by the cowboys. Uh, that number varies from different accounts from anywhere from three to 19. It was probably three to five is my guess. Um, and after that, the Indians left the Kumba. They didn't find it to be suitable to live. Another settler, John Speck, was also killed by Indians. He was killed 
in 1873, and he's buried in the cemetery. And again, a newspaper account explains exactly the circumstances of his death. His wife and two small children were at home when it happened, and you know she was very fearful for her life. She had to take the babies and uh, two miles to a neighbor's house after it happened. The other grave marker you see there is from Joseph Hayden. He died shortly after Will McCain. Uh, he was said to have become paralyzed at, uh, from injuries he sustained during a fall in a camp of horse race. That was a common activity in the backcountry. They would bet on their horses, and, and evidently he didn't stay on his. <laughs> Next. Now we'll get to one that you guys probably know. Eric, has everyone in this room visited this little cemetery? Uh, raise your hand if you visited the Mount Pisgah Cemetery. <laughs> Pisgah. <laughs> Only one? <laughs> Two? Alpine Heights Road. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, um, anyway, uh, when I visited the cemetery about a month ago, it was in need of some weed whacking and fence repair. It's kind of hard to find. Something by that water tank. Anyway, in Beatrice LaCourse's uh, book, The Settlement of a Mountain Community, she states that Mrs. Resin W. Pontus was the first in this cemetery. However, that's not true. How do I know? Because I followed the wife and she ended up dying in Washington State in 1902. And so she was never buried there. Um, so that begs the question, who was the first person buried there? I don't know, but you guys could investigate and figure that out, maybe. you got to put your detective hats on if you're going to do it, though. Uh, several of the folks who are here in this tiny cemetery died from tuberculosis. Louisa A. Willett was the last person to be buried here in 1907. She's the lady who donated the land for the cemetery. She could have been buried in the Alpine Cemetery. She chose her own land. Makes sense to me. Grave markers here were also burned by fire. Everything is. In 1994, a grand memorial uh, stone listing the names of the occupants was uh, installed. And of course, this is not the oldest cemetery in Alpine. However, I don't know where the Valley D. Los Viejas burying grounds is, but though that that bury, those burying grounds were referenced in newspaper articles in the 18, early 1870s. So you got some more work to do out there, guys. Um, I'm giving you a task here, I suppose. <laughs> I, I would start with old maps of Alpine and, and see if you can see something like that. Sometimes the cemeteries do show up on a map. Next. The Ortega Cemetery is located in Campbell on private land. You can't see it from the road, and you have to get permission from the owner to go in. It is still being maintained by the Ortega family, and the original, uh, the first occupant in here was a man called Geronimo Ortega. I like the sound of that name, don't you? Um, and Geronimo's sons were Stockman and Campo. Like many, next, next slide. And, and all these cemeteries, I don't keep mentioning, but all these cemeteries on little hills or little knolls or hillsides, they have a great view. There was nothing wrong with the choice. I think it had something really, though, to do with drainage. Okay. Like many other cemeteries, there's a lack of cemetery rec records, so a lot of these graves don't, are not identified. And that's unfortunate. You probably will never get that information back unless somebody really works hard. Given that numerous families of, of Spanish and Mexican ancestry are associated with the cemetery, it's not surprising to see DEP on a grave marker. It stands for Descanso and Paz, or Rest in Peace. So, and this cemetery is still active today. You guys aren't asking me any questions. What's with that? <laughs> the Petrero Cemetery is located in Petrero on Petrero Valley Road. It's easily accessible by the public. The earliest burial here was Alameda Williams Pearson, and she died in 18. And you can see the monument out in front. Many of Alameda's family, including her husband, McFall Pearson, a daughter, her parents, a brother, and a sister, are buried here as well. 
and the descendants of the Williams family uh, live adjacent to the cemetery and own the cemetery land and they maintain the cemetery grounds. Here we go, another connection. Uh, a number of George Washington McCain's family members reside here too. Ruth A. McCain outlived her husband by many years. She has two grave markers because someone else managed to be buried next to her husband before she could. <laughs> so that's what happens. And they wait too long. <laughs> Again, poor record keeping at the cemeteries results in common errors like this. Some other early pioneer families represented in the Petrero Cemetery include the Cameron family, Lauterbox, McGalman, Miller, Nelson, and Thing. And these are all very common people in the further east of Alpine recognize those names. They were um, early families that um, had a lot of influence and a lot of land. This uh, 1907 photo shows an elaborate graveside celebration for German-born Selma Lauterbox. And of course, the, picket, the wooden picket fence around the grave is no longer there, like so many. But that was the standard, that was the standard application. Wooden picket fence, no matter where it was. And of course, they just don't withstand time. Next. Determining the location of early family plots is even more difficult than cemeteries. And these are the ones that, that I'm going to talk about today. There are others. This tiny burial plot in Mount Laguna is the final resting place for seven related occupants. It's located in the, in the meadow of the former Kemp Ranch. The Cleveland National Forest owns the land, but the Kemp family still grazes their cattle there. And a modern epitaph at this gravesite reads, if you seek their monument, look around. And it is beautiful there. And the trails sort of go, the, some of the trails sort of go near there, but you have to get off the trail to make your way to this little, um, this little plot. The first in here was William, next slide. The first in here was William Chilwell. He was a stockman from England who died in 1888 when his horse fell over a cow at Mount Laguna. His widow, Louisa, then married his business partner, smart move, Archibald Archie Campbell. Louisa, Archie, their daughter, and now Chilwell, all share this scenic view, as does Nell's husband, Trevor Kemp and their son, James W. Kemp. And James is the last one in, in 2015. I don't know, there's still some more Kemps out there. It's getting pretty crowded in that little spot. Um, we'll see, maybe cremains are the answer. Next. Watt Gardner was an early stockman with family ties to the Campo area. This tiny burial plot ended up on the Manzanita Indian Reservation because the boundaries of early homesteads were often not correct. The Manzanita tribe maintains the grave site and public access is restricted. Next. Oh, hey, let me go back. There's three people buried there, I should tell you that. Uh, Watt is buried there and his daughter is buried there and his wife. <coughs> and now we're on to the Hayden family plot. And remember there was a Hayden in the Milwaukee, uh Pioneer Cemetery. So this is a separate Hayden family plot. It's sited in, on a hill in Clover Flat. This is a 2017 photo. The only grave marker that exists is that of Willie, uh, Willie Elliott. There were six burials that occurred here in the 1880s. <coughs> Marion D. Hayden was the family patriarch and he likely drunk himself to death. <coughs> His daughter, Ida, and their son, Johnny Williams, are also located here. And Johnny died from a rattlesnake bite. And that was a common death in this time, uh, given that there wasn't uh, proper treatment. People didn't know how to treat it. Elliot is a Native American name out there. Absolutely, and there's that connection. You're right, and, and I, I know some Elliots out there on the tribe. Okay, uh, non-Hayden family members here include John, uh, George Reynolds. George married G.W. McCain's widow, Martha. So there's a McCain connection to this cemetery as well. Poor little Willie Elliott, the one-year son of Catherine Cameron and Andrew Jackson Elliott, I love those names back then. You know, they were proud of their presence, weren't they? Managed to drown himself in a tub of water and was buried there. This is the only headstone that still stands. And again, you wouldn't know this again. You have to go into private 
private property, you wouldn't know it was there unless somebody took you to it. Next. Okay, the McCallman family plot is located in Long Petrero Valley. Uh, Captain Charles McCallman was a former seagoing mariner, and he was one of the earliest uh, white settlers in Petrero. Charles, his wife Alpha, and three of their children are buried here. Um, some of the other McCallman children, I think he had six or seven, were buried in the Petrero Cemetery. Today, the physical location of the Simon Miller family plot is not known. It's thought to be somewhere on the Campo Indian Reservation. Simon Miller was a German-born farmer, and his twin sons uh, were buried here. Simon Miller, a German-born far farmer, and his twin sons were buried here in the 1880s. One twin was buried shortly after birth. Eddie, the other twin, was bitten by a rattlesnake oh. while walking barefoot to school. <coughs> and here's the treatment he got. His aunt treated the snake bite by cutting off the head of a chicken and tying it to the boy's foot. But eight-year-old Eddie died anywhere. Imagine that. <laughs> the Walker family plot is located in the, the Boulevard area uh, in, on a hill overlooking Miller Valley. About 1868, George Walker operated a road station on the San Diego to Yuma wagon road. His six-year-old son, John Walker, Johnny Walker, I bet, um, <laughs> died there in 1873. George died two years later, uh, excuse me, 1870. George died two years later in 1870. And when I originally was doing this book, I didn't have the information about when George Walker died. I made some guesses based on delinquent tax records that he had died this year. And it turns out, reading another Pioneer Journal, that talked about him dying. So, thank God I wasn't too far off. Uh, Lucinda Lawrence was the other um, occupant here. She was the wife of Adam Lawrence, who was the first, basically the first white settler in the Hakumba area. They came from Texas about 1867 in a wagon train. Their trip took about nine months to get here. After Lucinda died in 1873, Adam Lawrence returned to Texas. Okay, getting near the end, guys. We're getting there. Um, there are many unique individual grave sites in East County. Some of their locations remain a mystery. But this is presentation we'll talk about just three. About 1870, Amos Buckman settled near some Lithia Springs southeast of Pine Valley. There, his family bottled and sold the, lit the mineral water for its health uh, benefits. That's questionable, but people bought it. The area then became known as Buckman Springs. Everybody knows the exit there on Buckman Springs. What you don't know is when you're driving down the freeway that Amos Buckman's grave is right inside that freeway chain link fence. In fact, when they were building the, the interstate in the late eight, uh, 1960s, they had to make uh, a detour so that Amos's grave would be outside of the, the freeway um, shoulder. Freeway, what do you call it? Yeah, it, um, easement. So they put this very ornate grave marker there. That's not something that anybody in East County would have done when he died. People didn't have that kind of money to throw after uh, fancy monuments. Next. And I'm gonna give you all a chance to read this article. This is one of those articles where, like I said, it is very graphic in its details of someone dying. And can everybody read it from back there? Otherwise, no. 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 Oh gosh. Okay. This is the. This was a, an article about Chuffy. Chuff, okay, Chuffy Clark. A terrible death. Henry Clark of Campo killed by an explosion. Henry Clark, a prominent rancher of Campo and well known throughout the county, was killed by an explosion of. Of giant powder. The accident happened on Mr. Clark's ranch where he was engaged in blasting stumps. Wow. He was, he was accompanied by his wife whom he had married only five weeks ago. The unfortunate man had placed a large charge of giant powder over a stump and while attaching the fuse, it lighted. The fuse burned slowly and Mr. Clark, thinking that the fuse had gone out, walked back to the stump and picked up the fuse. At that instance, the explosion took place. Mrs. Clark was terrified to see her husband lifted into the air and thrown some distance. She ran to him and was almost overcome upon finding his right arm and his leg had been blown off and that he had received other terrible injuries. I'm not sure what's terrible or terrible for that. Uh, 
and he was the stepson of Archibald Campbell. Uh, yeah, Archibald Campbell. So there's now a connection back to the guy that's up in the little cemetery in Mount Laguna. And that's what I mean about vivid articles. Um, and if you're interested in reading more of that kind of stuff, I'm putting a plug in here. My cemetery is a good place to start. Next slide. Okay. I included um, Richard Dick McCain in this presentation for two reasons. He was the last descendant of George Washington McCain, of the George Washington McCain family to run cattle in McCain Valley. He quit uh, uh, raising livestock about 18, uh, 1981. And also, he has a cenotaph which says, last cattle rancher in McCain Valley, of the McCain Valley Homestead. And if you don't know what a cenotaph is, I didn't know until I started researching cemeteries, it's like a place marker for someone who's actually buried someone somewhere else. In Dick's case, he died in Hakumba in, while he was digging up cottonwoods in a dry wash there, and he was buried in the Julian Cemetery in the McCain section up there. Um, so there's also a cenotaph of Captain McAlman at the Petrero Cemetery. Yes, ma'am. He died what? He died in Hakumba while he was digging up cottonwood trees. Oh, digging up uh, cottonwood okay. trees. Okay. And okay. so there's a there's a cenotaph <laughs> there in the wash where he died. Next slide. So these are some of the sources that I used for this presentation. Two of them are available. Ones with the stars are available if you're interested. And I'm happy to take questions from anybody here, and I'll do my best to answer them. Any questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Where did you say the, first, the very first cemetery in Alpine was? The one before Mount Pisgah? Uh, that's what I asked. You can't, you can't ask me that question. <laughs> I just came across that there was something called Valley D, Valley D Las Viejas Burying Grounds. I'm gonna guess that it was probably on the eastern end of town. I have nothing to back that up. But the stage station was down that way, and its chances are people died, and you know, the town sort of migrated, as far as I can tell, to the west and became Alpine. But back in the day, it was Valley de las Viejas. So that would be a good thing for, for the Alpine Historical Society to try to figure out. And then again, if you get really hysterical about this, you can, you can start looking through Ancestry, go to Ancestry.com and start looking at census data, looking at old newspaper articles. It is quite time consuming, but also somewhat rewarding. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. But where do you get the pioneer journals? Well, you get them from descendants of, of the pioneers. Okay. Okay. So it, it, it's interesting. When, if, if you remember, there's some places that have no cemeteries at all. You have places that sort of um, development started a little later. I'll give you an example. Descanso has a cemetery, but Pine Valley doesn't. Acumba didn't have many people, so it doesn't have a cemetery. Recently, I came across some journals about Pine Valley that were written in the eight, early 1870s. And they had a lot of information that I didn't know about, couldn't confirm. Like I said, I, I found some information about other places. I just happened to, to get that in the last couple of months. And we're going to be publishing that, um, Mountain Empire Historical Society will be publishing that journal when I get done uh, putting it together. So it's nice. If you can find that there's nothing like a, uh, the other place you can check, and again, of course, you have to have the descendants for that, is family Bibles. The old time family Bibles, people would write down when their children were born, when they got married, and all that other stuff, when they died. Yes, ma'am. Another one is just to keep your eyes open. When I was a kid, we camped with a group down at a campground that was next to the Banner Grade store. And the kids, we all went back on the back, the hill behind it, down through the stream and on the hill. There was a little cemetery there. Yeah, I, I don't even remember it having maybe three to five, you know, uh, graves. But it is one of those things you just have your eyes open and oh my, there it is. There are a lot of those around that you, you don't know are there. And of course, not everybody wants to let people know they have a cemetery on their property. Well, and, and at the time too, they needed to dispose of the body, you know, immediately. 
the yeah. other day. And it was too far to go, they couldn't get off away from their chores and so. And there's one book out that I read by the gentleman at uh, San Diego State that leads everything. Right. He talks about one that was at the corner of Miramar Road and Highway 15, Interstate 15, that the Scripps Ranch had, because they had this big ranch and they had workers and everything, and so if somebody died at the ranch, they buried them there. When the interstate went through, they got moved. Yeah, I think I have his book listed up there as one of my references. He wrote a book about the cemeteries of San Diego County and also one about cemeteries of San Diego. So, and I gotta tell you, it's a good book, but I did find out that, you know, I went in, in very deep dive into this area, and I have information in my book and things that contradict, in some cases, his. He did a broad brush over all the county. I, I was more focused. So again, you learn things every day. The more you dig, you come up with a little piece that fits in your puzzle and it's pretty it's pretty fun sometimes. Any other questions? There's a genealogy site called Find the Grail. Oh yeah, that's online. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's 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 a good site. And some of them have little bios of the people yes. that were buried there. Yes. Anyway, I was just going to go back to the, the Pine Valley uh, Chronicles, which was the, the, that I was talking about, which was a, like a journal. Uh, Pine Valley, one of the, the uh, people that kept that was an Emory family. And their son was buried in Pine Valley in 1873. And I got so excited because I live in Pine Valley. So I called up the descendant who gave me the, the journal. I said, where is, where is that burial? Because, you know, Pine Valley's not that big. And he goes, there's no burial in here. I said, well, it says it in the journal. He goes, oh, they moved that. They moved him. He got moved to Mount Hope in 1888. So just because you were put in the ground in one place doesn't mean you stayed there. <laughs> okay. And uh, that's, yes, sir. You you heard everything about the Cosman Cemetery down at Buffalo. No, no, I haven't. I do know a uh, cemetery in Hamul in Dearborn Van Valley on private land. Again, it just depends on you can you can. My initial focus for my book, and that's really what started this, was the Mountain Empire uh, Mountain Empire area, which stretches from Hakumba to Descanso and south to Campo and north to Mount Laguna. Some of these other places I came across. I'm working on a different book. And, and so I know a little bit about it. But there are likely, like I said, many, many more. And a good source is that 